All right, we're going to get started here. Thank you, everybody, for having me. Uh, my name is Patrick Kim. Um, I'm with the uh, University of South Florida and Tampa General Hospital. Uh, so we're going to talk about the uh, uh, ligament and flavum under the scope, uh, an anatomical guide to endoscopic approaches. Uh, although this may sound like a boring uh, topic, uh, this certainly, when, when I was making the slides, it gave, gave me a lot of learning points, and hopefully you can take away some of the, uh, um, the in, some insights as well. I teach for Arthrex. So uh, when you're doing, uh, when we're doing open or MIS type surgeries, it's like a, you get a panoramic view of what we're dealing with. So it's like walking the forest. You have all these uh, different landmarks uh, that you can see. Uh, whereas uh, with an endoscopic spine surgery, the optics is on the, at the bottom uh, where the where the uh, target is. So it's like a cr you know crawling in in the, in the forest looking for some you know clues. So. Uh, and that's why I think we should view the ligament and flavum as not this annoying soft tissue that we cut out uh, in, in our, during our surgeries, but it, you know, it can really provide guidance. Um, uh, one example is when I was doing posterior cervical foraminotomies, I used to get lost quite a bit because some of these patients who has a facet, a facet um, arthropathies, it's sometimes difficult to find the V point. So what I started doing was just to make a laminotomy window and find the ligament and flavum and go out lateral, right? So in lumbar spine, finding the midline, uh, the rafe of ligament and flavum is a first step in doing laminotomy. That's what Dr. Hopster taught me. Uh, and uh, doing a more decompression and ULBD type cases, uh, and knowing the ligament and flavum anatomy and doing an M-block flavectomy uh, increases efficiency uh, tremendously. So uh, we're gonna start with lumbar and move up away into cervical uh, and I'll tell you why these findings are relevant and you're going to see on this type of picture throughout this talk a lot on the right. Basically the cadaver models are cut coronally at the levels of the pedicle and we're going to lapse or open the posterior elements of the spine uh, but instead of doing lobster opening at the uh, lobster tailing at the lamina we were doing it at the level of the pedicle and we're going to look at the ventral aspect of ligament and flavum. So let's start with our first study. So this study looked at the uh, lumbar ligament and flavum uh, and, its lateral, and its lateral extent. So type, they determined the, the, based on what they found, categorized the cadavers into three categories. Type A, the, the lateral extent of the ligament and flavum does not go into the foramen. So if you look at the top, uh, top MRIs, a, you can distinctly see the ligament and flavum cuts off abruptly, this doesn't go into the foramen, whereas type C on the bottom, the ligament and flavum wraps under the uh, facet and goes into the foramen. So type A, there was, a, there was only 2%, so that's pretty rare, right? So, and type B, uh, the, the lateral the ligament and flavum reaches the posterior border of the uh, foramen, but did not cover it, 42%. And type C, uh, it's a lateral extent of ligament and flavum uh, went in and covered the most amount of the flavum. And that was a most frequent uh, pattern of the, uh, the specimen. Another finding here was that uh, the type C exists more and more on the bottom as you go, we went down on the lower uh, lumbar spine. So now let's look at this ventral view of the lumbar ligament and flavum. And this, if you look at the red arrow, you can see how the ligament and flavum or the butterfly is now uh, covering the the foramen in considerable amount as you go into lower lumbar spine, um, and um, and another you know uh, this is a study that's looked at the hundreds of uh, patients, a CT and evaluated the anatomy of the ligament and flavum. Uh, the finding here suggests that the angle of that the butterfly goes up more and more like a V shape as you go up in the lumbar spine, whereas on the bottom. The, it more it takes a horizontal um, kind of a shape. So you can take this as an advantage. So this is a patient who had an upper lumbar stenosis, right? So if you look at this ligament and flavum, uh, left is cranial, right is caudal, um, it's lateral, it's lateral, 12 o'clock is medial, contralateral side, and six o'clock is lateral side, right? So um, this is what it looks, this, this, this is what, you know, during my surgery, this is what it looks like after my bony decompression and bony drilling. So I expect the ligament and flavum to be more V-shaped because I'm in an upper lumbar spine. So I like to disconnect the, uh, the attachment of the ligament and flavum cranially and caudally so that the only part that I have to do, disconnect is the lateral limits of the ligament and flavum. And, uh, the way I like to do it is use a kerosene to 
grab the kerosene instead of punching every single byte, which increases the uh, uh, CSF leak hydrotomy uh, rates. But I usually just grab it and shear it off from the cranial to the caudal direction, and then re-grab it from the bottom uh, to, from the caudal to the and shear it to the cranial direction, so that I lessen the amount of numbers of punches that I have to make. Um, so that once you're done, you can do a flavectomy this way. And this is upper, upper lumbar uh, ULBD, so you can expect more of the butterfly shape, right? So whereas lower lumbar, um, you can see on the, on the right, uh, flavectomy takes the form of more horizontal butterfly shape uh, because it's lower lumbar uh, ULBD. Again, uh, if you do a fl flavectomy like this, there is a, you can minimize the kerosene usage, uh, and which leads to less gyrotomy, and you can increase efficiency. So now, another key point that was pointed out in this paper was that uh, in type B and C, um, if you look at the left side where the arrows are, the, um, the ligament and flavin covers the cranial aspect of the caudal pedicle. What that means is that the, you look at the red arrow on the left, the butterfly takes a dip onto the top of the, uh, the, uh, the pedicle uh, of, the, of that caudal pedicle, right? And that's important because when you're doing a bony foraminotomy, not trans SAP, but just purely a bony foraminotomy where I'm trying to cut off that, um, the, uh, cut off that SAP on top of the pedicle, uh, here uh, on the right side, you can, see the, uh, you can see the facet line here on, on, on 12 o'clock and on top of top right there. And once I'm done drilling, that means uh, because of the ligament, I'm close to the pedicle, the ligament and flavum is covering me uh, once I get through the cortical bone. So you can see here, this top tip of the SAP has been disconnected completely. And here is a pre and post-op. You can see I drill on top of this pedicle to to disconnect that SAP completely because, and in this case, because of the ligament and flame I'm attached to the top of that pedicle, um, I'm, I know that I'm protected to do this safely with the drill. Uh, here you can see the uh, uh, expanded foramen right here. <clears throat> so uh, let's move on to the thoracic spine. Uh, I know there's a lot of stuff here, but you can see, uh, you can appreciate the V shape of each uh, ligament and flame that's outlined in the ventral surface. Uh, notice the red box here. Between L T2 and 3, and, and as you move down, uh, approximately 50% of the cranial part of the foramen was covered. Now, that's the opposite of the lumbar foramen. So if you look at the red arrow on the left, you can see that it's, I'm pointing at the caudal pedicle, but there is no, no covering of that um, covering of the foramen by the ligament and flavum, which is the opposite of the lumbar levels, right? So the ligament and flavum is covering that uh, caudal pedicle, but in thoracic spine, it covers the cranial pedicle. So now, how uh, can we use that as our advantage? Well, so if you have a case like this where the ligament and flavum is completely ossified, the, the safest way to cut this out is by going out lateral and disconnecting it from the pedicle. So instead of using carry some punches, which you can actually you know, injure the spinal cord. So uh, in this case, um, I knew I had to go up to, to disconnect this ligament and flavum from the cranial pedicle, and I measured the ligament and flavum about 15, 16 millimeters. Uh, this is intra-op images, and I can just, without using the kerosene, I can, once I disconnect the flavum with the drill, I use it with the pituitary, grab it out, and I get about uh, 1.67 how about, you know, M block flavectomy, about, that's about how much I measured it on the MRI. Uh, so now moving on to cervical. So um, ligament and flavum in cervical is very interesting. So, so the width is, stays about the same, but it does get taller as you go down the spine. So notice the red uh, on the line. Uh, line. Um, ligament and flavum did not enter the cervical uh, neural foramen, and that's really important because uh, here is the um, um, cervical foramen, uh, the, the ligament and foramen compared to the lumbar. You can see there is no uh, ligament and flavum in the foramen in cervical spine on the left, right? And that's important because in, in uh, cervical spine, when you're doing ULBD, as you know, each kerosene bite can be dangerous because the instrument is so long that every time you introduce that kerosene bite, I'm always nervous about that. So. If you maximize drilling, disconnect the uh, ligament and flavum laterally at the junction of lamina and the foramen, you can actually remove this uh, you know, flavum 
quite safely without having to use the kerosene punch. So uh, now let's look at that from from an anatomy perspective. Um, the ligamentum flavum attaches more cranial to the pedicle as you went down, just like the thoracic, so because it made that transition from thoracic to cervical. So you're going to attach more to the caudal pedicle as you go up to the C2. And now it's you know, finding a similar pattern to the lumbar spine. Um, and that's why, you know, traditionally, a uh, laminophoraminotomy was performed um, in, um, you know, medial, um, medial cranial, a superior portion, and then either, depending on whether you're on the right side or left side, you know, people tends to drill the cranial attachment part first um, so that you can disconnect that and the third and fourth, which is a little bit more dangerous area. We're going to look at one more study here. This is not actually a ligament and flavum study, but they compared the V-point and, and measured its relationship with the uh, disc space and the nerve root. Okay? So the tendency that it found was that uh, the V-point gets um, more caudal as you go down in C6, 7, and C7, 1, and your target is going to move up cranially. The graph, figure seven here is telling us that um, as you go down to six, seven, and seven, one, the distance between the nerve root and the disc space gets further apart. Uh, and figure eight is trying to tell us as you go down into a cervical spine um, in lower cervical, then the V point and the nerve root separates up. V point goes lower, okay? Um, I know, so, uh, so now, Combining these two studies, so my takeaway was that find the viewpoint if you can, and follow that ligament and flavum cranially, and that's where you may uh, find your target, the root and your disc, right? And and this, however, this does change depending on which trajectory you take. I know in cervical spine, uh, you have to rely on AP uh, X-rays a lot because the shoulder gets under under underway, and lateral X-rays may not be quite helpful sometimes. So, so knowing all these things can help you guide and, and navigate uh, in the interlaminar or that uh, you know, uh, and the V-point or in the foramen. So, in conclusion. Uh, ligament and flavum anatomy is essential in uh, endoscopic spine surgery. In ULBD considerations, um, it can help you orient you and, and can uh, help, you, help you perform the phlebectomies for, your, for you to do efficient ULBD. Uh, in lumbar, as you go more cranially, the, um, the flavum takes more a V shape. In thoracic spine, the V shape of the V on uh, the lateral limits attached to the cranial pedicle and use that as your advantage when you're tackling these difficult cases such as ossified ligament and fl flavum to disconnect right there. In cervical spine, I always aim for flavectomy because, um, again, um, I think the procedure is safer if you can uh, lessen the use of kerosene. So therefore, I take my uh, you know, laminotomy out fairly lateral so that it's safer. Uh, in foraminotomy, um, the ligament and flavum covers the, the caudal pedicle so that you can get close to the pedicle and if, uh, do the safe resection of the SAP. Uh, and in cervical spine, uh, the ligament does not cover the foramen, and you can follow out the, uh, the ligament and flavum out laterally and more caudally uh, if you're lost. So thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Hofstetter and I are planning for an exciting uh, Spine Summit meeting next year. Uh, we're going to collaborate with COMIS, Korean Minimum Invasive Society, who has world experts in endoscopic spine surgery. So it's an exciting year ahead. Uh, and thank you again. <clears throat> Sorry? Can you put up that previous slide? Oh, this? So, Pat, uh, thank you for that. It was a very good summary of the literature for ligament and flavum. Um, I don't know if you mentioned this or not. I might have missed it in the beginning, but did you talk about the three layers of the flavum and how sometimes you can utilize that yeah. knowledge to, to up change your approach a little bit? So, you know, I, when I started doing more research into this, the traditional thought, you're right, the ligament and flavum has outer and inner layer. Uh, which is more appreciable in, or, or three, right? <laughs> but, but, but more recent literature started saying that, that may not be always true because when they do all these different histological staining, some, some authors claim that it's actually one layer that fuse into that uh, interspinous ligament, and maybe that's part of the outer layer. So 
When I'm doing ULBD, I don't think I really distinguish. Uh, I know it, it's typically for me, it matters more if I'm doing a caudal laminotomy because I have to take it more cranial direction to, to strip that outer layer, but, um, but yeah. So when I was taught in fellowship, um, we, you would always take the three layers, you take the top layer and it makes mm -hmm. the managing like a really tight stenosis a lot easier. So I, I use that same knowledge from fellowship in endoscopic. Yeah. And what I do is when it's really bulky, I will just release the, because if you look at the way the flivin, it's kind of like a sandwich over the lamina. Mm -hmm. You can actually burr off the, the, the caudal end and remove that top layer. And it makes managing the rest of the flavum a lot easier because I think a lot of beginners have trouble with flavum management. Right. Um, um, that's the biggest issue with laminectomies endoscopically. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but thank you. Thank you, Pat. Okay. Uh,